So, now for the serious stuff. Now we have the talk about 20 years of Java. Now, I did want to actually ask, because I have to ask this, was anybody born after 1995 here? <laughs> okay, right, so we're all old enough to at least you know, be as old as Java. <laughs> so what Steve and I wanted to do was really to put together a, a retrospective of 20 years of Java and do it in a way that was you know, kind of fairly lighthearted. So I'm going to take my hat off because I don't want to present in my hat. Um, so we're just going to talk about Java and our memories of Java from the last 20 years because, um, as you'll find out, we have been working with Java really almost, well, Steve's been working it since the beginning and I've worked for it since long after the beginning. Um, now, as Oracle employees, we are duty bound to put up the obligatory safe harbor statement, which says that we're not committing to deliver any particular products on a date which we're going to mention in this presentation. This seems somewhat irrelevant, <laughs> since we're actually going to be talking about stuff that, from the last 20 years. But anyway, as an Oracle employee, we have done that, so we'll, we'll move on from there. So, Steve, if you would like to introduce yourself. Okay, well, we'll do the quick introductions and then get into the meat of this. Yeah, I don't think you can, uh, you can have safe harbour statements for looking, part, you're looking into the past. Uh, so, we just put a quick slide up each on the, the two of us. This is me. Um, I was actually born in April 1957, which is four days after the first commercial Fortran compiler was <laughs> delivered to Westinghouse. So I was kind of destined for this. Actually, the other thing I could have gone into was astronomy and space science, because obviously Sputnik went up that year as well. So this was actually Fortran delivered to Westinghouse on a, a IBM 704. Um, anybody want to guess what the first thing that happened when they ran it was? It didn't actually crash, but it did give a syntax error. They missed the, <laughs> missed the comma out, which they hastily fixed, and then it, it actually ran. So we've had you know, plenty of time since then. Um, we've got another slide a bit later that talks about some of these languages in their right place. This is actually my personal kind of sprawl of languages, starting out with my, uh, my language sibling um, in the mid-'70s, um, running on ICL mainframes and HP 3000s and things like that. Um, and then, interesting enough, just in terms of the context of this presentation, um, the Pascal stuff, I actually, um, in the late 70s, which again is probably not something a lot of people in this audience are going to talk about, in the late 70s, uh, I actually had a play with the UCSD um, Pascal compiler, uh, which obviously is one of the precursors in terms of generating bytecode. It generated Pascal P code and was influential in some of the stuff going into Java. Um, the only other thing worth mentioning on here is, before getting into the meat of this, is um, the things in blue are actually not strictly languages, they're hardware description languages, but I worked in the electronic design business for about uh, 10 years, and there's some interesting stuff that came out of languages like VHDL and Verilog in terms of concurrency and operator overloading and so on, which again kind of tied into this. Um, I joined into what was at the time Sunsoft in 1993, and started playing around with WebRunner and Oak um, in 1994. So just before um, Java went public in 95, but we'll get into the meat of that. And then obviously rolling into, uh, into Oracle. So okay. over to Simon. Right, and my equivalent slide. Um, I actually, I'm a little younger than Steve, but not much. Um, so my first programming experience was with Algol 68. Anybody here ever used Algol? Oh, okay, a couple of people used Algol 68. Punched cards. That was my first computing experience. Good, okay, a couple of people with punched cards. Um, after university, I, I ended up at AT&T doing Unix in C, and then I joined Sun in 1996, in February 1996, just after 1.0.2, <coughs> I think it was. <laughs> was actually released. And I would just like to point out that when I joined Sun, I joined Sunsoft, and Steve was actually my host manager when I first joined Sunsoft. Um, and then obviously we moved on from there. So, over to you, Steve. So, because I'm the, the old git in the team, um, <laughs> I get to do the early stuff. Um, the more astute amongst you will have noticed that the, the slide here actually has switched to future, because normally both Simon and I are talking about the future of Java. But in this case, we're going to put the thing into reverse and take a little look back. Um, pick your favourite quote in terms of learning from history, but although this is a bit of a rambling um, trip down memory lane, 
Um, and it's definitely not going to be, require a lot of thought on anybody's audience, so you can sit back and let the nostalgia flow over you, have a bit of a relaxing time. Um, but there are some lessons to be learned, and I think that we do ignore some of the stuff that we've done over the last 20 years um, at the loss of stuff going forwards. Anybody know what this is? <laughs> it's actually the location of the Internet Archive, uh, the Wayback Machine. They've actually been in this. It's, an, it's actually an old church in San Francisco, and they stuck all the servers and everything into where the pews used to be, which I think is great. If you look at the internals of this, it's, it's worth, a, worth a, a visit to the web page. Um, they actually started out in the Presidio in, uh, in San Francisco, and they moved from there um, to this location. But en route in 2009, the, it spent a brief period of time in a shipping container. Um, those of you that go far back enough with some may re recognize this as the Sun Black Box, um, which was the code name for it. It did have a, a much more boring product name. Um, but basically a shipping container that you stuck a load of servers in. So this is actually the inside. Um, this is uh, Brewster who kind of ran the, or runs the Internet Archive and Greg Papadopoulos, who was the CTO at the time, inside. And this thing was packed full of the old Thumper uh, storage systems. Um, the interesting thing about the Internet Archive is that it, it's a fantastic facility, and yes, I have donated to it because I made extensive use of it to, to kind of get some material for this. But sadly, it was founded in 1996. <laughs> so uh, as you can see here, it doesn't go back quite far enough to play around. And there are other resources that we've looked at for this, you know, in particular Usenet um, mail archives and stuff like that. There's some good stuff uh, down in there. But we have to look at alternative me methods of, of uh, finding information. So one of my uh, original subtitles for this presentation was a cabinet of Java curiosities. Um, but as you can see, it's not really a cabinet. It's actually my storage locker. And I think Simon's got one of these I, I, as well. I was going to say, I'm, ju I'm just going to interrupt there because I, I would like to say that, that I'm really happy to be doing this presentation today because I can prove my <laughs> wife wrong. There was a point to keeping all this crap. But there's, there's also a sad reality to this in terms of, if you look at some of these devices, particularly in terms of the, uh, I've got quick tapes and exabyte uh, tapes and VHS tapes and good stuff like this. And of course, it's a point that's been made several times by people that we, we are actually losing some of our heritage from the fact that a lot of these things are actually quite difficult to read now. So you need to rewrite some of this stuff. And it's actually, again, part of the Internet Archive project to kind of do this. This is actually a set of training tapes on cassette recorders. So I'm sure there are some people in the room that have never had the pleasure of, of doing this. There was some, I, I can't remember who did it, but there was a, um, a kind of an age test that somebody put up and said, what connects these objects? And it showed a cassette tape and a pencil. <laughs> <laughs> OK, some people get it. The other interesting thing when I started to read some of these things is that the, uh, I've got some of the CDs from the original Java 1, and we'll come on to the Java 1 conferences a bit later. Um, but sadly, part of the problem is that they've got PowerPoints on them, but the, the latest version of PowerPoint doesn't read PowerPoints from 1995. Um, fortunately, because they were produced by Sun, they've got HTML versions as well. Ah, backwards compatibility. Yeah, we'll come exactly. back to that. There's a lot of other stuff in my lock and store as well. As you can see from the table up the front here, um, Gadget Man here is going to go into a lot more detail of the, uh, the fun stuff, but this is kind of a, a selection. Certainly, I can't compete with Simon in terms of the badges. I mean, if you've seen Simon's office, he's got like a whole wall full of conference badges. I threw most of mine away, but there's a smattering here. I do think one of the oddest ones um, is the one in the middle here, which is a hockey puck. For those of you who remember Java 1, you kind of open up your bag thinking, what great stuff have I got in here? And it's like, it's a hockey puck. <laughs> so I never did work out what useful stuff I could do with that. One of the things I pulled off of one of those VHS tape record tapes that was uh, in the lock and store was, was actually a, an interview I did back in, I think it was 1998, for the BBC. This, this guy here, he, he said, I want to film this as, as live. And I said, that's fine, OK, fine. I sat down, and he like, leered across at me, and he said, so, Java, hype or what? <laughs> and I, ugh. Anyway, the rest of it actually went quite well. But the only reason I put this up is 
I've actually lo uh, well, not lost my um, uh, Java ring is in my cabinet of curiosities, <laughs> and, and despite kind of rummaging around there over the weekend, I couldn't find mine. But Simon's going to cover the Java ring a bit later, so we'll get into that. One of the interesting things when you look when we looked at this presentation is. 1995 is a very strange place when you start thinking back to it. It's very hard, even for people that have been through it, to kind of wind the clock back to think what it was like then. You know, no Google, no Facebook, no Twitter. I'll come on to some of the hardware stuff in a minute. I'm not going to go through all of this stuff, but there's some interesting stuff uh, worth mentioning on this slide. I think there was a book produced called something like 1995, The Year the Future Began. And there are, some, there are certainly uh, quite a lot of things that, for whatever reason, happened in that year. Um, obviously, Java was introduced, and we'll get into the details of that. As has already been mentioned by some of the discussions earlier, we also had JavaScript appear in its earlier form of uh, Mocha that Brendan Eich put together actually just over 20 years ago now in the infamous kind of nine-day um, hacking together. <laughs> and doesn't um, it show? That was, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That was released in September, I think, in the beta of um, uh, Netscape Navigator 2.0, which is an important release we'll come back to. And in fact, Netscape Navigator 2.0, um, I think it was beta 3 or what have you, came out in December of that year, and that was when it actually renamed it to JavaScript as part of the deal that uh, Netscape and, uh, and Sun did. The release of Windows that was around here is interesting because, of course, Windows 95 was also released in that year, but not until August. So most people on the desktop were using Windows 3.1. How many people have used Windows 3.1 here? Oh, God, that's <laughs> terrifying. The, I, I, I said to Simon, it'd be interesting to see what sort of crowd turns up. You've got all the old phonies turned up to this one. We were hoping for some young people, but they're all doing the, the important stuff somewhere else. OK. so. So when Java came about, of course, it wasn't going to run on Windows 3.1 because it does, just doesn't have the threading model and the capability of doing that. So when we originally released it, it was geared for Windows NT and obviously Solaris as well. So Windows NT was released, I think, in March or April of that year, and Windows 95 came later. And then we got all the browsers. Um, we got IE10 came out. We have um, Netscape Navigator, obviously. And we'll talk about Hot Java, the T-shirt. <laughs> Um, a bit later. I was, I was thinking, I'll come by, back to it later, but T-shirts were all black in those days and browsers were all battleship grey. Um, and you'll see that in the demo that we're actually going to run in a second. Um, as well as JavaScript and Java, there are a couple of other languages that appeared that year. Um, although they would again, as with these other languages being around before then, they were released in uh, 1995, and that's PHP and Ruby. So we do have some kind of interesting siblings in, in, in this space. <clears throat> um, what else is worth mentioning here? A few companies that uh, appeared. Oh, this is some of the stuff that amazed me when I started looking at this. I didn't realize DVDs were introduced in 1995. You know, we didn't have DVDs. And it's interesting when you look back at some of the articles from the early years of Java that a lot of this is around kind of combining the internet and CD-ROMs, because at the time, there was a whole trend around CD-ROM publishing and interactivity on CD-ROMs, all the Encarta stuff and all this stuff that came along later. And obviously, the internet kind of tweaked that a little bit. USBs came around then. Um, and one thing before I move off of this that probably is, is worth mentioning is somebody died that year um, that was actually instrumental to some of the stuff that we've been talking about in other sessions around Java for a long time now. And that was Alonzo Church, um, who died, I think he was about 92 or something like, <coughs> like that. But obviously, a lot of the Lambda stuff came from those backgrounds. So if we look at the hardware that was around in those days, um, don't worry, I've, I've, got a, a, I've got a zoom in so you don't have to try and read the text. Let me but, guess, you, you've still got that laptop, haven't you? <laughs> I, actually, I don't know whether I have. <laughs> I still got the little Scion 3C, because this was pre-Palm. I mean, Simon's going to talk about some of the gadgets later. Um, but the PDA that I had at the time was the Scion 3C, which didn't run Java, sadly. Um, although I think the Scion 5 did. Um, but the phones, you know, fa fantastic WAP phones with a little display, you know, you couldn't really do too much Java on that. Um, but if we look at the computing in terms of the processor that was on a typical laptop, and uh, the kind of network speeds. 
This is a little unfair because, again, both of these were taken from uh, magazines in 1995, but this is talking about a 486. Actually, the Pentium uh, Pro was released that year, and Pentiums were, were, were pretty much around. But either way you look at it, you're talking around 100 to 150 megahertz uh, CPUs, typically about 8 megabytes of RAM. So when you look at what the early Java stuff did, you know, crunching it into there was, was quite an accomplishment. <coughs> And again, I won't read through the other stuff here. And the other thing, obviously, is that networking, um, in terms of what you got to your laptop or your home, was really still around modems at the 33 kilobit per second speed. Um, the Java group, when they released Java, were on the end of a T1 line. And I've actually got faster internet into my house now than they had into the Java group that, dis that actually distributed all the original releases of Java. We'll come back to this fella later. Simon's going to go into a bit more um, around Duke. But Duke started out, thanks to Joe Palrang in the, um, the, the Java team, um, at first person. He kind of mocked this up. So we could have ended up with the thing on the left instead of the, the Duke that we know and love. Um, but he was the kind of predecessor based around the Green Project. Because again, although we're talking about Java being 20 years old, it's kind of an arbitrary... <coughs> uh, date, as you'll see in the next slide, in terms of beginnings, because it really goes back to 1990 when the Green Project started, and I think James Gosling started working on what was uh, Green Talk and then Oak and then Java in middle of 91. Again, most people know that Java, um, Java's earlier name was Oak. Um, internally, it was also called Green Talk for a while be uh, before that. And again, there's some quite nice articles around um, that kind of summarize all those early years. But the, the little guy in the middle there with the thing on the top, this was, again, many people have seen this, the Star 7 device. There's a link, I think, on the earlier slide, which if you haven't seen it, take a look at the YouTube video of James Gosling demonstrating this. You've got to remember the date that he's doing that demonstration, which is kind of a giveaway from, from the length of his hair and the color of his hair at the time. But, um, it's actually it's, it's quite impressive for the era. This is, this is the Star 7's guts. And again, similar to the PC that I put up before, it was basically a Sun Spark station folded over and compressed into this little tiny space. Uh, it had a radio link. It had what they call hammer technology in the green team, um, i.e. They, they took all these bits and smashed them up with hammers and pulled all the different pieces together. So they had Game Boy speakers, they had uh, touch screens, they had the bits of the, the Spark Station running SunOS uh, under the covers. But again, look at the memory, you know, four megabytes of RAM. So this is the beast that uh, Java originally ran on in terms of its first incarnation. Very, very constrained um, space. So again, if we look at the beginnings, there are actually many. It started out um, <coughs> back in the 90s uh, Patrick Norton, uh, Mike Sheridan, and James Gosling were the kind of original members of the team that started to put this together. And uh, James basically picked up the, uh, the software element of this through the, uh, the Oak language in terms of the development in the middle of 91. The first demo of this done on the device that i just shown you was in September of, uh, of 1992 uh, to Scott McNeely inside Sun. And as a result of some of that, they span off this division called First Person. When I joined into Sunsoft in 1993, they had, uh, you got this box of stuff, and one of the things in there was a little manual to kind of orient yourself, and at the front was all of the Sun business units. And Sun was a complicated uh, company in that respect. It had all these little different moving parts and widgets. But down at the bottom was this thing called first person. And I never thought to kind of uh, think about it until much later, but again, that's, that's roughly the time that I joined, and they were off in a completely off-site facility from Sun. Um, basically focused around consumer electronics in the beginning. And again, there's several articles and presentations from, from James Gosling that kind of address those beginnings of Java as a language focused around some of the priorities in the consumer space around security and reliability and the network uh, elements. That didn't pan out. Again, lots of stories uh, you can read in more detail about why and what happened there. But basically, in 1994, they reoriented it towards the internet. And the internet was obviously on a roll at this point. So um, they created this thing called Web Runner, which was a web browser running on top of the Java runtime. 
Um, and as with some of the other things, the, uh, the trade names didn't pan out, and WebRunner is what became Hot Java. Um, funnily enough, WebRunner, I believe, was actually trademarked by Caligent. Anybody remember Caligent? Oh, yeah. The uh, Apple, yeah. Motorola, was IBM. Pink? And funnily enough, I think, and Mark can probably tell me, I think the, the, in Cupertino, the original JavaSoft team actually inhabited what was the old Caligent yeah. building. So there was, uh, there was some interesting sort of history back then. Anyway, 1995, which we're talking about here, we actually started to release this onto the web. Um, and we originally put this up in sort of February, January, February of 1995. We put it up on a kind of limited distribution to people on an um, external website. Um, but then the, the publicity started to hit in sort of March through May of that year. And in March, the San Jose Mercury had a, a headline news about uh, Sun and Hot Java. And in particular, this had a uh, a very positive comment from Mark Andreessen, who, of course, at the time was the golden boy because uh, Netscape had just gone public and uh, the web was, was taking off big time. So it hit, and that kind of accelerated a lot of the activity leading up to the official announcement that was at Sunworld in May of, of that year. And uh, again, you know, th then we started to get this into uh, Hot Java and into some of the Netscape Navigator releases. The actual 1.0 release didn't hit until January of 96. So we've got plenty of opportunities for birthday celebrations. <coughs> um, just like the earlier slides that Simon and I put up, um, languages have kind of influences and ancestors in the same way that people do, and they also adapt to the environment and, and stuff that's going around. Um, Java itself actually has influences from many, many other languages. I think uh, James Gosling has said many times that you know, he doesn't regard himself as a core language designer in the same way as the, the folks in the Scala and Haskell world and so on that are much more academically focused around trying to come up with, with um, perfect languages. Um, Java was always um, a means to an end. It was always a tool uh, to actually solve a problem, in this case, around the original consumer electronics problems and moving into the internet. So um, as, as such, uh, again, James has famously called it a blue collar language. So it shamelessly uh, sucked in all this information, all these um, uh, information and things from other languages. There's some slides at the top here, which are actually from, um, again, a, a quite early um, presentation around some of the language features. And as it says, you know, you've got things like dynamic linking and uh, garbage collection from Lisp, you've got concurrency from Mesa, exceptions from uh, Modular 3, and of course all the stuff from C, C++, and in particular Objective-C in terms of influences around the language. And it was very intentionally targeted at something that would be familiar to the bulk of, uh, of uh, programmers that were around at the time, which were largely around C and C++. So the first public demo was given um, in February of that year um, at the TED conference. And sadly, I can't find any kind of videos. I'm sure they exist. But this is actually from a little animation that somebody put together uh, for one of the Java ones around this, where uh, John, K John Gage went off and kind of uh, said he needed to do a demo at this show and uh, went past James's office. And James sort of grabbed all this kit and, uh, and went off in uh, John Gage's Volvo, apparently, to, uh, to Monterey to give this demo. Um, actually, at this point, let me see if this is going to work. Let's just take a look at some of this. So <clears throat> most of you have probably seen this already, but this was the, more or less the demo that they gave at that conference, which is what really brought home the difference between what was around at the time and what Java could provide in the client space. And the real big difference was obviously the interactivity. Remember, up until that point, Netscape Navigator 2 hadn't shipped. And that was the first browser that even had animated GIF support. So until that point, all the browsers were basically very static. It was text, it was graphics, and that was it. With Java, however, you could do this kind of stuff. You could take molecules, you could move them around, you could interact with them. <coughs> and the molecule demo and the other demo of the time, which was um, the app, sorry, which was the Tumbling Duke, which again, we can bring up here. 
<laughs> with a, some of the first um, uh, applets and the first demos that they actually produced on this. Now, that's actually quite interesting, because Simon yeah. gave that to me earlier. Well, you, you explain. I was going to say, because um, what, what's funny about this is, one is you can see that screen resolutions have increased over the years, because it's a tiny little thing. But the other thing is, I actually took this off uh, this CD here, which was the, the Java demos from 1996. I didn't recompile it. So that's 1.0 code that's just running on a JDK 8 virtual machine without any recompilation. Um, there are some other ones on there that won't run because the, there were some differences between 1.0 and 1.1, I think it was, where some of the, uh, the byte codes won't actually run on uh, a modern VM. But it's interesting to see that there are applications that were compiled with JDK 1.0 that will run on JDK 8. The, the other interesting thing here is that, of course, you assume that every browser out there is going to have a battleship gray background, so you don't need to worry about uh, that. Uh, the other thing, by the way, this, this web page, this is running live, this is going out, and it's going out to Imperial College just down the road. And Imperial actually did some of the work on some actual uh, real work around molecular simulation and so on based on this, again, back in 1995. So this was starting to get out very, very quickly at the time. <clears throat> So, after that, things really started to take off. And uh, in answer to the question of where were you in 1995, for me at least, um, I was here. I was at Some World, 1990, uh, Some World 95 in, um, yeah, in um, May. And that's where we actually announced um, Java to the world. And again, a lot of focus was around the client and things like the browser stuff. Part of the reason for that is that, to a lot of people's surprise, even within Sun, the person they brought up on stage as part of this announcement was uh, Mark Andreessen, because he announced that they were actually going to embed Java into um, Netscape Navigator. And that's really what, what took it big time into the, the world, right? Mm. Cut out. True. OK, well, I'll carry on anyway, because I'm going to pass over to you in a second. Can you hear me? Oh, out. You can put that in. Out? OK. Well, I guess you need to record that guys too. So turn it on. So I'm going to wrap up and let Simon uh, have the, the second half of the presentation. But just before I finish, the, the strange thing is that Hot Java actually ended up being a lot more front and center than Java the language to begin with. And obviously that's changed over the years, particularly as we've moved to the, uh, the server side. Pay no attention to the man behind the speaker. <laughs> oh, okay. So I, I want to make sure you get the time. <clears throat> One other thing that, uh, that happened, uh, that I'm going to skip over very, very quickly, but it does show you that not everything works out the way people planned, is that uh, obviously in December of that year, Microsoft, in fact, Microsoft and IBM signed in, uh, and the whole slew of other companies signed up to license Java in December of that year. Um, that leads on to a whole other discussion that I'm not going to get into here. But one of the things that is interesting is the following year I actually attended this. This was the Microsoft Java Developer Conference, uh, 1996. Um, and I've actually even got the CD with a copy of uh, Visual J++. So I might pop down to the Microsoft booth and try and get a, <laughs> an update to that later. Um, Java came to the UK in, uh, in January of 96, and again, I was at this conference. Uh, the only interesting thing about this is that I was trying to find a description of this, even though I was there and I've got, I hadn't found my notes to it. And I found a really good write-up on, of all things, the Annals of the UK Text Users Group. So it shows you you shouldn't always look in the obvious places for, for information. The other thing is that uh, Miko Matsumura was the first... Uh, Java evangelist. He came into this from Hotwired, and so in a way, he's kind of uh, Simon's uh, uh, ancestor in, in the role. But I will point out that one of the things I found out fairly recently is apparently he did do a bungee jump off of the San Francisco Big Bridge dressed as Duke. So <laughs> I think you should start. I, I, to plan I won't for be that. doing that. No. Uh, these are my early presentations. I might bore you with this, but the, the point of this is one of the things that was going on at the same time, and again in the context, is around distributed objects. Distributed objects are going to solve the world. Corba, 
and all that good stuff. So I spent quite a lot of that year actually presenting not only on Java, but how Java tied into back-end and, and those are then. acetates, aren't they? So you need an overhead projector yeah, for that. Yeah. Um, I was going to say, I, I actually did have an acetate here to wave around, but that's the other thing when you start looking back at this. The reason they're so ugly is that these are actually acetates that you need an overhead projector for. So again, coming back to the original kind of uh, trying to track things. So I'm going to hand over to Simon. Um, Java 1 obviously started out in 1996, and there is a very important point to this in the sense of Really, we are sitting in this room as kind of descendants of some of the starting point here and developer conferences and actually getting people linked in with the community and actually transferring this information is one of the reasons why Java was so successful. There was a lot of effort put in at the beginning to this, and I think that will uh, make it more, more interesting. So I'm going to hand over to Simon. That, that, that's your slide as well. So you, yeah, I know, yeah. but I'm okay. just <clears throat> skip over it. Okay, so we'll, we'll skip over that then, because yeah. that was the... Oh, yeah, sorry, one thing... Yeah, th this is my first notebook from Java 1. If you click on the next slide, these are some, my notes from James Gosling's keynote. And it is quite interesting. And again, I won't take up all the Simon's time, but a couple of things that uh, James was saying at the time, and again, this was uh, in 1996, was the language is very stable, but they're considering maybe method pointers and parameterized types, <laughs> which ties in with the previous presentation and some of the stuff. And also, maybe one day we'll look at extensions for other languages. <laughs> OK, over to you, Simon. Right, OK, yes. So one of the things about Java 1 was that they had the, the show device. And so over the years, you had the opportunity to buy Java devices. And being the, well, the, being the collector that I am, I bought most of these. And so uh, let's see, we, I've got my Sharp Zorus here. Very nice piece of, of equipment. Um, I actually, I, I, in fact, if I press the button, yep, it actually powers up. Uh, the backup battery doesn't work very well, but um, eBay will provide me with one for £7.45. Um, one of the things I also tried to do is I tried to get my, my lovely uh, compact flash um, network connect and net connection to work, but um, it uses such an old version of uh, Wi-Fi that I couldn't get it to work with my, my, um, my Wi-Fi network. The, the other thing that I will mention about this, because yeah, I've got enough time, was it was only 16 megabytes, and it was a pre-production version. So the production version had 32 megabytes. That makes quite a difference, having twice as much memory. And so it was very difficult to get things to run on it. So I thought, right, I'm going to be clever. You know, I come from a Unix background. It's running Linux. I will be smart. So what I did was I actually put a, a swap file on my machine at home, and then I used a Wi-Fi connection to use the swap file, which is great until the network stack gets swapped out, and then it all stops working. But, but we won't go there. Um, the Java Ring, um, that was another one that was, that was actually a giveaway, wasn't it? Because they, they gave yeah, that Yeah, that was to, actually yeah. the first giveaway that they, they included. And then we've got the, the Pulse Pen, which you could actually um, program in Java, and you could change what it said on the little display, which I don't think works anymore. Um, of course, the Palm Pilot, again, I got my Palm Pilot out, and lo and behold, it actually powers up and works. And... I could have probably even write Java applications for it if I could find any uh, development environment. And of course, uh, this one's actually Steve's because I didn't get this one, which was the, the Savage A phone, um, which I don't know, what year was that? Can you remember? Uh, that was like 2006 or something like that. Yeah, no, it was a while ago. Um, yes. Uh, anyway, <laughs> moving on. Um, yeah, then, then of course, it's like, how do we make money out of Java? So <laughs> this was an early plan for revenue, which was. Java gifts. And uh, I've got to say that I've, I've actually got quite a collection here. So, <laughs> so here's. Socks, no. <laughs> I've, got, I've got a pair of Sun Microsystems socks. Now, they're not strictly speaking Java, because on, on one side you've got the Sun logo, on the other you've got we are the dot in dot com. Or as it became, we are the dot in dot bomb, yeah. Um, and then I've got the, the Japanese one that uh, is the, the very nice uh, Duke headscarf. Um, and I've got a very nice little Duke bag here, which uh, turns into Duke, um, and some various sort of um, foam Dukes as well. Now, going back to Duke, of course, as Steve said, early on, the Duke was the agent. And this was a person, you know, an animation that was going to help you on the Star 7. And that got, kind of got morphed into Duke who became the mascot of Java. So it's a quick trivia question here. Who knows the name that Duke had 
before he became Duke and after he was the agent? Oh, nobody. It was who? Bill. No. <laughs> we, we, actually, we actually had a bit of an argument about this, and I, 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 I think I did get proved right, didn't I? You did it's, get proved right. Yeah. It's Fang. It used to be called, for very briefly, but, it was Fang. But apparently Joe Palrang said, no, Fang sounds really nasty, and he's yes. a nice guy. <laughs> yeah, because he so looked Gosling like a... renamed him to Duke. I was going to say, he looked like a tooth, that's why. Um, and then uh, Duke even had his own, his own comic, which we produced. <laughs> and I actually have that there. Um, Let's see. And then, obviously, Duke has been through very variations. We've got all sorts of different uh, versions of Duke there with, with different things. Uh, I like, particularly like the one with the beer mug. Um, and then, of course, we had to be politically correct, so Duke became in, Duchess. Enlightened. Well. Yes, enlightened. <laughs> and, and so, yes, we, we recognise that there are lots of, of women in IT as well. Now, we talked about... Uh, Java Workshop. So here's a nice screenshot of, um, it's a little bit blurry in places, but you kind of get the idea. Nice battleship grey look, you know, very, very sort of um, in keeping with the modern UI theme, really, I think now. <laughs> um, also, I actually counted up, there's, there's room there for 10 lines of code. <laughs> so clearly, you know, you, you're going to be able to be very productive there. But it was quite a nice idea. I actually installed the, the Java Workshop on a virtual machine on, vir on VirtualBox um, because I thought, oh, let's, let's fire it up. And I got it to install, and it, I, I started up, and it said, your license has expired. <laughs> <laughs> which I think is probably about 19 years ago. <laughs> now, in terms of history, then we kind of move forward. And, and in 1998, we kind of reorganized things because Java was getting much bigger. And there was a lot more to Java in those days. So it didn't really kind of fit into one thing. So we called it Java 2. And so there we had Java 2 with Java 2 Micro Edition, which was aimed at, like, mobile phones and smaller things than desktops and, and that kind of thing. We had Java 2 SE, the standard edition, which was the core platform, the virtual machine, the language, and so on. And then we had the enterprise edition, Java 2 EE. So that was the app server and, and all the, the APIs that go with that. And then right at the end there, we got Java Card, which we'll, we'll come back to in a moment. But you, this was the idea of, of making... You're going to say something? <laughs> this is the idea of making it into more manageable kind of platform pieces. So, Sorry, I, I can't resist. No, it's been, uh, okay, shout. No. Um, do, do you know what, what was Java called after it was Java and before it was Java 2? Oh, no. Okay, yeah, so the question is what was Java called after it was Java but before it was Java 2? No, I don't know that. Java 2000, oh. ah, yes, in keeping with Windows 2000, yes, very, I, I like it, yes. Unfortunately, that's one of the Yes, probably a good idea, as we'll see. Um, other things that we did around Java, it's, it's worth mentioning this, because this was Genie. Now, Genie, who remembers Genie? Oh, okay, yeah, so we're the yeah, usual audience, okay. Genie was a wonderful idea, but it was, it was very typical of Sun in that it was technology that was far too ahead of its time. Because if you think about what it does, is it essentially allows you to have lots of devices connected where they're going to join and be removed from the network all of the time, which is really what we're talking about with the Internet of Things. And through the idea of leases and the idea of you know, having a, a very, it was really quite a simple but very elegant system for how you dealt with these, um, the problems, um, Deutsch's uh, fallacies of network computing, then it solved all of these problems. But it never really took off because it was originally um, shown using devices. And I think, do you still actually have the devices somewhere? Yeah, the, I've still got some yeah. cameras and things. Actually, one thing just really quickly, because I yeah. know I chewed up some of your time earlier, but interesting, the Java Ring demo from 98 was a client into Java spaces at the back end. So what they did was a Mandelbrot of about 80,000 pixels. That's right. And every Java Ring computed a 3 by 3 pixel element. So it was distributed computing on a large scale. Yes, that was it. It was all about distributed computing and solving the problems of that. 
And other things that we tried in terms of um, where we could position Java was the, the Java station. Now, anybody remember the Java station? Okay, a few people, the Java station, which, again, it was kind of ahead of its time because it was the idea of, of like stateless computing where you would have the processing on the box, but all the storage would be out in the network. And this kind of morphed into what we later called the Sunray, which was really actually very good. And because I, I remember having like my Sun card, and you would you would have a desktop that you could you could recognise with the card, and then you could be working on that. You could pull the card out, go to California, plug your card into another machine there, and the same desktop would come up exactly as you had it before. So, but. The problem with these was that it was just not enough memory. So they had like 8 or 16 megabytes of memory. And it just wasn't enough to really run the applications that they were trying to deal with. So then we had another crack at it. And we thought, right, let, let, where can we put Java now? So it's like, right, let's, let's go with Pico Java. Pico Java is where you've got like bytecode executing um, in silicon. And so I even managed to find the Java chip roadmap. <laughs> and uh, so we got, you know, this is like 1999 to 2002, and we've got all sorts of ideas there. And eventually this kind of morphed into what became the, the magic chip. Anybody remember the magic chip? Oh, yeah, a couple of people. Uh, the problem with this is that it, it's, it's the issue of static versus dynamic. And because Java is a dynamic language in many ways, both from the point of view of class loading and uh, things like that, um, it, it just... Trying to put things in static in silicon actually doesn't work. You can actually be more effective by doing things in software, um, as we've seen with, with um, adaptive compilation and, and those sorts of things, and aggressive inlining and, and all those sorts of good things. Um, which then sort of brings us on to Java Ring, which was the idea of Java in very, very small devices. Um, this was really, the, the, essentially, the Java card system placed in a ring with just a, a small processor and a, uh, it was a Dallas one-wire connection system to it. Um, it. It basically allowed you to use Java to program these things, but it was a kind of subset, a very small subset of Java, and it had to then be sort of squashed um, into fitting into literally tens of kilobytes. Nice thing about Java card is that all GSM sims, so everybody who's got a mobile phone, has Java in it. Regardless of what you might think, it's actually in the SIM card. So that was one thing. And then there was another project, which was Sunspots. And the nice thing about this was the, the idea behind it is it's really kind of like a, a very early Raspberry Pi. So we were, again, kind of ahead of ourselves with the, uh, the, the project there. But the real sort of theory behind or the research behind this was all about trying to put a JVM on a system without an operating system. So the, the Squawk VM, as it was, actually ran on the bare metal. And so I've got a couple of these, um, these sunspots here. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to boot it up. So if I press the button there, it flashes for a few seconds. And then you'll see, yeah, there you go. And that's it. Let's boot it. And so it's, it was nice and quick. So if I boot the other one up as well, what they do is they will talk to each other, because you'll see that, one, that that one went green. So this is what we call the ball in a jar demo. And what I can do is, because there's a couple of switches on here as well, is if I, I can open the jar on both sides, and then if I tip this one, it'll actually tip the ball into, should do, oh, hang on, did I, no, I didn't press the button, there we go. Oh, there we go. Hang on, have I got it? There we go, yes. So that, then I've, I've got the ball in the jar, and both of them are there. If I swap them over, I should be able to do. Does it work? Should go through. Yes. Oh no, hang on. It's the wrong way around, isn't it? It's that way around. Try that. Don't go up to people in the street. And say, Does it anyway. work? Anyway. <laughs> right. So I'll leave those. Uh, yep. There we go. I'll oh, probably reboot. Anyway. Um, which leads me to the, the last part I, I wanted to talk about, which was a sort of um, a brief history of the JDK. And I, I actually stole Mark's graphic of the different Java logos. Um, simply because it, it's really interesting to look at how the JDK has morphed over time. Now, obviously, back when things were simple, back in 1996, you know, the roadmap was JDK 1.1. <laughs> and then you can kind of vaguely see in the background there's like uh, security and um, Java media and commerce and then enter. And it's just like, <laughs> not quite sure what enter is, but off you go. Um, 
So here's an interesting one. So code names for different releases. Um, before 1.1.4, apparently we didn't have code names for these. But then we started off with 1.1.4, which was Sparkler. And then we went to Pumpkin, Abigail, Brutus, Chelsea, Playground was 1.2. For some reason, we decided 1.2.1 wasn't going to have a code name. Um, and then we went to Cricket. So obviously somebody thought, well, Playground, Cricket. And then somebody thought, Cricket, Cricket's an animal. Let's use animals. <laughs> so then we went to Kestrel for 1.3, then Ladybird which was 1.3.1. Then we stopped using bird, no, we stopped using animals and went to Merlin, because I remember that one. Um, and Hopper, Mantis, and then the big one really was JDK5, which was Tiger. And I remember Graham Hamilton being on stage with a live tiger at Java 1 when we launched that. Um, then we kind of, it sort of like drifted. So Mustang was JDK6, and if, it kind of, Dolphin was JDK7, but that kind of drifted off um, at the, towards the end because Oracle don't kind of go for this kind of thing. <laughs> no? <laughs> okay, we'll, we'll come back to that. Right. Features. So this is kind of an interesting thing. It's just looking at how we added a whole range of different features to, to the various versions of Java. So JDK 1.1, um, that introduced things like Java Beans, so like the, the sort of pattern of how you can access properties and things. RMI, um, JIT compiler, and inner classes. Great thing there. Um, then JDK 1.2, we introduced Swing because we needed a better way of doing graphics than AWT, the, the abstract windowing toolkit, or as many people refer to it, the abysmal windowing toolkit. Uh, the plugin was introduced, the IDL collections, and strict FP was introduced in 1.2. 1.3, Hotspot started to come in. That was sort of like an optional bit, and uh, started, there, there was more RMI over Corba and the Java Sound API apparently in 1.3. JDK 1.4, JCP started, so we started changing the way that we developed things and opening up the process in terms of the community. We introduced Web Start, there was the new I.O., the wonderful logging API, and assertions. <laughs> JDK 5 was the big change in terms of, of features, so we introduced generics with backwards compatibility, auto-boxing and unboxing, the concurrency utilities from JSR 166, annotations, varag, static imports and enumerations, so lots of big language features at that point. JDK 6 was a little bit of a smaller release in terms of features, so there was some scripting in the Rhino JavaScript engine. We had XML on web services was kind of the big thing in terms of the, the libraries type things. Seven, um, JDK 7 introduced, some, again, some, some nice language features. So we had Project Coin, we had the Fork Join framework. First change to the actual JVM bytecode um, set, so Invoke Dynamic, NIO2, and JSR166X. It was either X or Y, I can never remember, which was um, further enhancements in terms of concurrency. And then, of course, we're up to date almost with JDK 8, introduction of Lambda, Lambdas, Streams API, Date and Time API, Type Annotations, and Nashorn. Now, I will give a copy of the Java Language Programming book signed by James Gosling to anyone who can tell me what is the relevance of the three features marked in red. No, you don't <laughs> count. You don't count. At the back, what's that? Yes, but what's the relevance of that? So again? Backwards compatibility. Yes, thank you. You get the book. So this was the three times we broke backwards compatibility by introducing a new keyword. So suddenly you couldn't use strict FP as a variable name, you couldn't use assertion assert as a variable name, and you couldn't use enum as a variable name. I remember thinking at the time, ah, oh, nobody uses enum. It's such a short name and nobody would use it. So I recompiled some of my own code and lo and behold, I had used enum as a variable name. <laughs> Bigger means better. So I did an analysis of uh, all the variants of the, the, the JDK in terms of number of classes. And back in 1.02, we had 211 classes. And that's kind of gradually moved up. There were obviously um, there were some fairly big. 1.1 <coughs> to 1.2 was a big leap. And there was a reasonably big leap between 1.3 and 1.4. And uh, again, sort of incremental leaps up till we're at. Uh, the, the last version, of that was the version on uh, the website 
as of a couple of days ago, 4,544 classes in JDK 9. Brief note on deprecation. So deprecated was introduced way back in JDK 1.1, all the way back in 1996. Since then, and again, I did some analysis on this, if you look, there were 18 interfaces have been deprecated, 23 classes, five exceptions, 379 methods, and 20 constructors. How many of those have actually been removed since JDK 1.1? <laughs> You're right, zero. <laughs> of course, JDK 9 will change some of that, maybe. Um, and then the other thing I like is looking at the number of options that you can use on the command line for the JVM. So this is clearly the Oracle JVM. This is the minus XX super secret. Uh, well, not super secret. Well, kind of secret, because we don't really document them that well. Um, and so we start off at 1.4 with 159 minus XX options. And uh, by JDK 8, we're at 629. And in JDK 9, we've actually removed six of them. So we actually made pro we, we go down. Yeah? Right, so that is good because that's one minute to go. So the last thing then is I'm actually happy to give away an original Sunspot kit. Retail value was about $400 actually because these, these were uh, very expensive to produce, unopened. And I have to ask a question though. So I need, uh, so, so put your hand up if you know the answer to this and I'll see if I can guess who actually puts their hand up first. There are 50 reserved words in the Java language. Can you tell me the two, and I want both of them, that are not used? <laughs> yeah, you don't count. <laughs> oh, come on. Yeah, one, <laughs> I got one and not the other one. Oh, no. Am I not going to be able to give away my sunspot kit? OK, I'll tell you what. What was that? OK, all right. Well, OK, uh, uh, right. Who could put their hand up quickest if they tell me one? OK, yeah. Uh, hang on, no, hang on. It's, uh, no, not you. Uh, how, how about you? Yeah. Go to, yes. You win the sunspot kit. <laughs> the other one is const. That's the tricky one. Right, and that is it. That is 20 years of Java. Thank you very much. Thank you.